We're going to spend some time in looking at, at management. And one of the things that we're going to talk about as far as management is concerned is productivity management. How productive are your employees? I think that as a food systems manager, that is something that is of great concern to me. And that's a lot of my research interest, and that's where I have done some publishing in that area. So I think that um, I'd like to spend a little bit of time with you talking and working with productivity. But what we're going to do right now is probably a very important aspect in determining the productivity of a work group and a facility. So we're not going to go into a great deal of depth, but at the same time, enough depth to give you some understanding of what you would need to do. In terms of competency, I do not feel that my students, including you, um, are going to become a layout and design specialist. But at the same time, I feel that you need to be able to talk intelligently with an architect. So to learn the language of the architect, to be able to contribute to the planning of a facility. And so when we talk about design then, we're talking about the overall space planning looking at the relationships of one work area with another work area. And layout is the detailed arrangement of that equipment within the work area. So for example, if we were talking about the um, dishwashing area, the design part of it would say, this is the area in relationship to all of the other areas that the dishwasher is going to be. And as we look at that, we're going to want to see relationships and traffic patterns, not necessarily aisleways, but just overall relationships between the work areas. Then when we get to the layout, we're actually going to put down on paper the various equipments that would be necessary and the relationship of this equipment to one another so that there is appropriate flow through the work area as well as throughout the whole facility. Just as an example of this, um, let me see if I can, can change here rather quickly and so I can look at a pad. Okay. What I'm wanting to show you here is overall relationships. In a facility where I worked, we had a patient tray line in this area. In this area, there were four small elevators that took the food from the um, end of patient tree line to the various levels of the hospital. This area over here was cold food like salads. This area was cook and then way back off the screen is where food storage was. And way back in this corner right here was the dishwasher. 
And so trays were assembled here. They were sent up the dumbwaiter. They came back the dumbwaiter and had to be pushed approximately 50 meters from the uh, elevator back to the dish room where the trays were disassembled. The items were run through the dishwasher and then they had to be taken all the way back to the beginning of the patient tray line in preparation for the next meal. So was that a good layout, a good um, arrangement as far as design was concerned, as far as the overall space planning? I think not, because of the tremendous amount of transportation that had to go on in assuring that the dishwashing was done appropriately. Uh, we'll come back to that in a few moments. So the global understanding is that food product flow is different in every food service operation from the facility that you're going to be in, the facility that I'm in, facilities that we visit, they're all different. Now in terms of design, the most beneficial, the, the very most desirable approach is going to be a straight line. And so this flow as being a straight line is a nice objective, but it never happens. Because we are confined within the space and so we need to make some 90 degree corners or we need to make some other corners that um, are going to be necessary in order to look at all of those relationships. But nevertheless, what we want to typically see is food coming in from the receiving dock and flowing through in a straight line through storage, through production, through service to the customer. So that's the kind of straight line that we're talking about. If we were talking about the um, patient tray line, again, we're going to want to see a straight line. But there are tray assembly systems that are circular. But even though they are circular, it has a definite beginning point and a definite ending point. And so with that, we can be hopefully as efficient as possible in dealing with the um, food items. And then workstations, like the dishwashing area that we were just talking about, or the tray line, or the cook station, should be designed to allow employees to work efficiently and effectively. What's the difference between efficient and effective? Do you know? I didn't know for a long time. I'm sorry? Efficiency is talking about the productivity. Are the employees able to work quickly and have trays assembled in a reasonable amount of time? That does not necessarily talk about the quality of the tray. Is the tray assembled so quickly that mistakes are made and the patients are getting wrong food? Effective, on the other hand, is talking about to what degree are we achieving our goals and our objectives. Okay? So this statement on the board is saying that we want our workstation so that the employees can produce a high output of meals, but also accurate meals that are going to help to meet our overall goals and objectives of our organization. Okay?
So the basic thing that we were talking about when we talk about flow of goods, we're really talking about materials handling. Materials handling is terminology that um, is dealing with flow of employees or flow of goods and services. So we can look at it, or it could also mean flow of information. So it may be people, it may be things, or it may be electronic information. But in terms of actually handling food that is coming into the storeroom, we want to try to store as close to the point of first use. So if we have a area where salads are being made, it would be appropriate to have adjacent to that this refrigerator, the storeroom, where those items are going to be stored at first, not as a secondary storage, but as a primary storage. The other aspect of materials handling is that we want to apply um, principles of motion economy. And we're going to talk about that in, as another topic in just a moment. And minimize storage and handling. What the tried and true advice is, handle each product, handle each piece of paper that you deal with only one time. Do something with it. Every time you pick up a piece of paper on your desk, do something with it so you don't have to handle it again. Don't come to my office and evaluate that in my office. <laughs> but it is a very important thing to do. And as we are looking at the layout of a food service, that's even more important, that we deal with it right where it's going to be used so that we don't have to, to circle around and, and do it once again. We want to systematize as well. Group similar functions, and that was an example that you gave in tar as far as the, the storeroom. You want to put like foods together. Use good handling practices. Use mechanics to lift or to transport. The other day I was showing you a patient tray line that was made out of, made with rollers. Wherever we can use rollers to bring food from the delivery truck into their storeroom, going to be a very practical thing for us to do because we don't have to use um, energy from our bodies to transport or to use a lift truck whenever we have enough space to do that. And then communicate. That is the other aspect of materials handling is that we can communicate either by paper, by voice, by electronics preferably what is needed and how we're going to get that product to where we need it. But another aspect of this is to use lights or other electronic signals to indicate when something is going to happen. The best example that I can come up with this that you may be able to relate to is a crossing signal on the street when a train track crosses. So when a train is coming, we get a signal saying that something is going to happen, that. Um, the train is coming and we need to take appropriate action, and that is to stop. Again, you're food service director, and you have now been asked to participate as a member of a planning team to plan a revision of your hospital food service. And so the process that would be used in making these changes, or it may be not a revision, but an actual re, um, new construction, where you're doing something from, from brand new. So we're going to use the principles that we have just talked about in terms of motion economy in laying out our facility so that we have as high productivity as possible. So members of the planning team typically are going to involve members of administration. Probably not the top administration, but maybe the vice president or whomever that you report to that is a representative of administration. Then there's a food service team, which is going to include you. It's going to include um, any major supervisors, your executive chef, 
and I would include some cooks and other production workers because I think we need to get their input into this, what is going to work for them. The architect is going to be a member of this team as well because this is the individual that's going to do most of the work. But another individual that really should be a part of the team is a food service uh, consultant. An individual who is knowledgeable about pieces of equipment, how they fit together, has a really good systems background to know how things should work. And as a consultant then, can help us to ask the right questions, provide answers to those questions, so that we don't make mistakes. The unfortunate thing about <clears throat> what I just drew on the board, on, on the pad, in terms of the way that flow goes through that um, hospital, <clears throat> the individual who designed that is a very close friend of mine. I don't think that he did anything in terms of working <clears throat> with a group. He did it all himself. And so there were many things that were done in that layout that were very, very serious mistakes. And we live with them to this day. No, um, no remodeling has been done. And so the cost associated of inefficiencies over the 40, 50 years, 40, 45 years, I think, anyway. Yeah, this is the 45th year of that kitchen operation in, in the same format that it started. The capacity in terms of number of patient beds has more than tripled, but the food service stays exactly the same. <clears throat> One of the things that we as food service managers need to be able to do is to communicate our needs to administration and say, you know, we cannot go on like this any further until we make some significant changes in our facility. So this planning team is going to get together and the process that they go through is referred to as a charrette. A charrette is a collaborative planning session where all of the members of the group sit down together and talk about, first of all, the design of the facility and then more specifically the layout. I have seen charrettes that have been done in an afternoon where all the members of the team are there. They have a, an initial layout that they look at and evaluate and by the end of the afternoon they have the entire layout and design of the kitchen done. Is that possible? <laughs> It doesn't seem, because many times this takes months to do, but with computer-assisted drafting, um, and you have in there all of the pieces of equipment that are put in there to scale, it's just a matter of uh, placing those pieces of equipment, and then behind that is all of the information regarding the utilities associated with that, and so you get suggestions from the computer as to what pieces of equipment need to go together because of utilities, but we need to look at pieces of equipment together to look at it in terms of utility and in terms of productivity. So one of the first steps that is taken in the charrette without having a, um, a, uh, an example of, the, um, of a layout, a proposed layout, Typically the first step is a bubble diagram. Okay. The bubble diagram may even start out uh, simpler than what I am going to do, but let's assume that we have been given this space for the kitchen. And let's say that this is going to be the receiving dock. So in terms of systems analysis, 
we're going to want to see then essentially the food coming in, being stored, processed, served, and distributed in that straight line that we were talking about. But we know that that can't happen. And so what we need to do then is to construct a, bu a bubble diagram. And so the bubble diagram is just going to be a series of ovals like that. And so this would be receiving. Why can't we? Receiving and storage. Okay? And then we're going to have a work area here. We're going to have a work area there. And we need to look at volume. Is most of our product going to be pre-prepared or is it going to be raw materials that we're going to use in a conventional production system? So in order to really effectively do a bubble diagram like this, we need to have the menu. The menu is probably the most important input into this layout um, design process. Knowing information about how the food is going to be prepared, what pieces of equipment are going to be necessary for this, that is all going to enter into the bubble diagram. But probably one of the most important things that we would look at in this bubble diagram is do we have this kind of a flow That is not a good example of straight line. Um, I would much rather see something that would, let's erase some of this so that we're not confused. What I would like to look at is something more along this line. And then to, to service. A bubble diagram like this is very easy to draw. You don't have to be a drafts person. You um, just need to be able to draw a circle. But it is a representative of the thinking that's going into your whole analysis of the, of the system and how everything is going to fit together. That is really what we're looking at in this bubble um, analysis. One of the requirements that I would like for you to complete by the end of this um, school term is for you to do a bubble diagram. And what I would like for you to do is to take the menu that you have written, and because you know that, you know the kinds of equipment that's going to be necessary in order to do a bubble diagram, and I will not put any constraints on you as far as limitations of walls, but you may just do a bubble diagram that shows the relationship of the various work areas that you think would be most effective, most productive in terms of producing meals. Okay? It's not going to be difficult. It probably won't take you very few minutes to do. But the process of sitting down and thinking about all of these relationships. I wish that my friend had sat down and did some thinking before he began the actual layout and design of the facility. Because there does not seem to be a great deal of effort put into looking at each of the various, each of the work areas and the relationship to one another. It is this skill in terms of design that's going to be most critical for you in dealing with an architect. An architect is going to come in with their own design. But with your chef and with your supervisors and with the experience that you have, you may be able to 
identify some major problems that the architect has and eliminate those so that it is not going to negatively affect your operation for the rest of its life. This kitchen that I have referred to, there may be a glimmer of hope in that it will be revised at some point, but um, probably won't happen in my lifetime. <laughs> so anyway, that's where we are. Do you need, do you know enough now how to do a bubble diagram? What am I looking for? Just that overall relationship. How do pieces fit together? This is an excellent example of systems approach to management. Looking at inputs, looking at outputs, and the processes that go on between those two, I think is, is critical for us to look at. Okay. Okay, so that would be done in a charrette. And from that, in that charrette, we would develop the bubble diagram. The constraints that we're going to face in doing this layout and design. Number one, always number one, is the menu. The second is the production style that's going to be used cook chill, conventional production, cook freeze, whatever. Um, that, those are going to be constraints. And so you need to have that in mind when you do your bubble diagram. What kind of service style? I was talking last week about um, some food services that everyone comes into the dining room at the same time, they sit there and food is brought to the table and there's someone who portions the food out for every individual. That's a service style that is rather extreme, but it has significant implications in terms of the kind of production equipment that you need. You've got a lot of production equipment that's going to be needed. What about staffing issues? Um, staffing issues is going to be a direct result of the kind of production system that we have. And so, um, we still need to look at staffing in terms of the number of employees, um, that's, uh, in terms of the number of customers that we are serving, and other constraints that hospital administration puts on us. And then we also need to look at the capacity of the facility. Does it have enough room to grow? Or are we like the hospital that I'm talking about we don't have any room to grow, but we're still expected to produce meals. And we do produce meals, but at a very high cost in terms of the effect that it has on the employees. So capacity is a, a factor that I hope that we'll have some time tomorrow that we can really look at capacity and determine how we would measure capacity, because it really is important um, in our food service operation to know what our limitations are as far as the number of meals that can be produced. So, in terms of this whole process of planning, we've gone through the charrette, we've gone through the bubble diagram, we have evaluated all the constraints that we have to deal with. And so now, we are going to get back from the architect after hearing all of these activities um, that are expected we're going to see a program that has been written by the architect. The program is going to outline the goals of the, org of the um, project. What is it that we're really trying to do? Currently, I'm a member of a planning team for the revision of our school building. It's an old building like the main building uh, that you have here and what we're trying to do is to preserve the historical nature of it, but bring it up to date technologically. And um, one of the words that we're saying, or phrases that we're saying is, that we want it to be an inviting place. What 
and, and actually making a positive impact on an individual when they first walk into the building. You only have one chance in order to make that first initial impression. And so it's got to be a good impression that is made. And so we're going to evaluate that. Um, currently in this project um, is that we're looking at an overview of the activities in the space. How are we currently using the space? And whether we're doing a revision, a remodel, or brand new, we've got to look at each of the spaces and what is really going to happen there. How does that contribute to the achievement of the overall goals of the organization? That has to be spelled out very, very carefully. Terms that we're using now are mission critical. Things that are absolutely necessary in order for us to achieve our mission. That has to be included in new design. It has to be included in programs. Everything that we do needs to be measured in terms of mission critical um, processes. And so the thing that we're next going to look at is allocation of space. Each of the departments in the school have certain amount of space. And so we're looking at relationship between departments and among departments and how much space do they need for the kind of activities that they do on a daily basis. Um, like we have a kitchen as part of our school and so we can't move that kitchen because it is permanently located there. And it was only finished two years ago and the large amount of money that was spent in doing that, uh, they don't want to repeat that. They don't want to move that kitchen anywhere. Um, then there are some basic assumptions that need to be made as well. What, are the, what is the access to the facility? Um, one of the issues that we have to deal with is handicapped access. Uh, can an individual in a wheelchair um, conveniently uh, make use of all of that space? Uh, what are the environmental conditions? Um, does the um, customer, the patient, have to go through areas where it's extremely cold or extremely hot? Uh, that's something we want to try to avoid. Um, I saw a kitchen one time that was located in such a way that in order to deliver the food to the patients, the food had to travel through a tunnel. The tunnel was also a steam tunnel with steam pipes running along the side on the wall. And have you ever had a steam bath? That's what you had when you walked through that, that uh, tunnel. So environmental conditions have to be taken into consideration there as well. And what about fire protection and mechanical needs? How can we assure that in the event of a disaster like a fire that um, it's not going to spread to the rest of the facility? Um, or if there's a fire in other places, it's not going to spread to the kitchen. And then what mechanical needs are necessary? The same mechanical needs that we were talking about as far as handling of materials is going to be dealt with in this situation. But it also includes um, utilities, um, gas and electricity and water and steam and uh, compressed air and all of those kinds of things that are going to be needed in order to do the, um, the work that needs to be done. Then comes the next step where we're going to actually put all of what we have written down in words in terms of a picture. And so this schematic design is a blueprint. You've all used blueprints or looked at blueprints. That's exactly the stage at which we are right now. It's going to begin with a preliminary design which is showing how much space is allocated to each facility, um, looking at the proposed materials that are going to be used, um, What's going to be on the walls? What's the surface of the wall going to be? What is the floor going to be? Um, are there any electrical or mechanical issues that we've got to deal with? And in a large hospital facility, there are lots of them. 
In a moment, we're going to be talking about heating, ventilation, and air conditioning. And in order to get heat or air conditioning into a facility, it takes very large um, ductwork to get it to there. And so when you have ductwork going through a work area, you know, you just can't go through the ductwork. You've got to go around it. You've got to plan it in such a way that everything can coexist within that organization and within that layout. And then finally, at this point, the architect is going to come back and say, given what we have done so far, this is an estimate of what the cost is going to be. Is this going to be within your budget? Um, yes or no? If no, what can we change? That change is referred to as value engineering, taking out things that we had our heart set on, so they're no longer there. Um, but going back to the design of our kitchen in the school, it's the first project, and I've dealt with a number of projects, it's the first project that I have been involved with where value engineering was not done. We got 100% of what we wanted. I don't, I've never seen that happen before. I'm very, very happy about that. Okay, heating, ventilation, and air conditioning is a, con is a concern. Um, there are four really concerns that we've got to deal with. Um, you don't have air conditioning in this building. There is, yes. Yeah. But you also have steam um, radiators for heat. And other facilities, like um, maybe your home, you have air that is coming through the ductwork that is coming from either the heater or a central air conditioning. That is referred to as supply air. Then that supply air is introduced into the space and then it is taken out of that space and recycled. It's either rechilled or reheated so it comes back. So you're not starting out with uh, zero degree air that you need to heat up. You're dealing maybe with um, 20 degree air that you're bringing up even a little bit more. So that's the return air. Now in food service we have supply air and return air. But we also have exhaust air. And that has to do with our kitchen hood. So when the hood is on, there is a great deal of suction from the fans that are in there, pulling air from the production area up and out of the kitchen. And that is not recycled, it is just up and out. Then there has to be air brought in to take the place of that air that has been um, exhausted. And so the makeup air is going to replace the exhausted air. So we've got heated or air conditioned air coming in, or maybe just um, outside air that is coming in, bringing in fresh air. But the thing that we've got to do is to balance all of this um, air that's coming in and going out. Because have you been into a room that um, has negative air pressure? Negative air pressure is saying then that the air pressure in the room is going to be less than the pressure outside of the room. And so what the tendency is, as you open the door, it's going to open very, very quick. So that air is going to flow in there to try to balance what is happening. Um, you know, that, that negative air pressure in a room. Now, positive air pressure is just the opposite, that more air is being brought into a space, and so when it comes time to open the door, you've got to really pull because the pressure in the room is greater than the pressure outside. So what we want to do is to balance that air so that um, the door will open easily. But there are some times in which we want to have a negative air pressure, or sometimes we want to have a positive air pressure, particularly in the event that we're dealing with um, biological materials. 
we don't want biological materials being sucked out into another room. We want them really to go up the exhaust or filtered and dealt with appropriately. And so um, we want to have typically a negative air pressure in that kind of a situation so that as we have an exhaust vent that the air is going to really want to go up that way and taking all of the um, aspects that we don't want left in the room such as uh, microbiological items. Another thing that has to be dealt with, um, one other thing I'd like to say about ventilation, and that is that's not something that we're going to have to deal with as food service directors. But I think it's important that we understand the language of what these engineers and architects are talking about so that, you know, we don't, um, that we always make positive suggestions in terms of this planning process. The materials that are used in food service equipment um, typically are metal. And there are three metals that are used most often. The most prominent one is stainless steel. It's referred to as 188 stainless steel. Have you heard of that before? Do you know what 188 means? 188 is talking about the percentage of the alloy that is going into the stainless steel. Um, it is nickel and chromium. Those are the two um, elements that are added to just the steel to make stainless steel. And so 18% chromium and 8% nickel is what goes into the most common stainless steel. I have seen 1810, I've seen some other modifications of this, but this is the most um, usual and the most um, prevalent, same thing. The advantage of stainless steel is that it does not rust in normal conditions. It has a very long life, and I was talking with you about that earlier last week, about stainless steel tables and equipment that have lasted for 45 years now without really a lot of damage. And so it's, a, it's expensive to begin with, but in terms of life cycle cost, the cost of using it over its entire life, it's going to be far, far cheaper than going any other direction. One of the disadvantages of stainless steel is that it is not a good conductor of heat, but that's typically not a problem for us um, unless we have an all stainless steel cookware set and you can have hot spots and cold spots in that stainless steel. But um, stainless steel will pit if you are storing an acidic kind of food in it. The best example that I can think of is brown sugar. If you put brown sugar in a stainless steel canister over a long period of time, it will pit, make little holes in it. But nothing to the extent that you will get with aluminum. If you put brown sugar or other acidic kinds of foods into um, an aluminum container, you get a lot of, of pitting. Aluminum is a much softer material than what stainless steel is. And so if you have a, um, an aluminum lined um, tilting skillet, like we have at home in, at our school, um, as you use the spatula on it, it's making little holes in it. And as a result of that, um, food will burn in there and it can affect the taste and the quality of the food. Aluminum, because it is soft as well, is not really the best as far as veneers on refrigerators or freezers or that kind of thing because again, um, they will pit and mar very easily and so they don't look as good um, after a few years. And then galvanized. Do you know what galvanized metal is? Galvanized metal is just a very thin sheet of, of metal to which zinc has been put on the outside. And is this a good 
piece of um, material to use in food service equipment? No? Why? Okay, it will scratch, it will mar very easily. Um, there are old situations where um, water coolers have been made out of zinc galvanized material. And if you put anything other than water in there, like lemonade, that lemonade will react with the zinc and give you an overdose of zinc and cause some major health problems. So um, stainless steel or plastic is probably a good thing to use in terms of your lining of um, beverage containers. Now plastics are taking over an awful lot of what is happening in food service. This is a plastic material right here that we have on the surface of these tables. Um, last a very, very long time, a very, very good, as long as they're of high quality. But there are some that are low quality and they don't last very long. So you need to know what you're buying when you buy this kind of a thing. Then the other materials that we are going to use is ceramic tile. There are several different types or ways in which we could use it. Um, small squares on the wall that would, could go all the way to the ceiling or at least two-thirds of the way up the ceiling. And then in this space, we would cover that with a, um, a covering of stainless steel to protect that corner so that as carts and other things come and touch that, it's not going to destroy the ceramic tile that is there. We also use ceramic tile on the floor. Um, clay tile is probably a better term than ceramic. Um, they are about, it can be any size, but maybe 10 centimeters square. And the problem with that is that you have grout or concrete in between these, and that's hard to keep clean sometimes, but it lasts forever. The other issue with that is that when it's wet, it can become very slippery and very slick, and you can go sliding and land where you don't want to land. Equipment. We want to use equipment that is approved by the National Sanitation Foundation International. This is an international organization. I don't know if you use that here, but um, they are looking both at sanitation and safety and design of, of equipment so that it can be um, easily cleaned of appropriate materials so that it will last an extended period of time. One of the standards that the National Sanitation Foundation International has is having to do with the cleanability of a piece of equipment. And so when you construct like a sink that is made out of stainless steel, you've got a bottom, you've got sides. And so when you put those all together, you come up with a square corner down at the bottom. What the National Sanitation Foundation International is saying, what we need to do is to make that corner a rounded corner so that we can clean in that corner. Otherwise, if it's square, you can't get all the food out. And so that's a, a very nice thing. The other thing that they're looking at is in terms of the actual safety of the piece of equipment. And they will do what is referred to as a bullnose corner, and a, a bullnose edge. And here's a bullnose corner in which the side of the um, table or the equipment is rounded. And it is of fairly good size, because you can add a piece down there and, and make it so that it's large. Have you ever run up against a, a sharp object, you know, when you're playing? And, you know, if it's like that, it's going, that's what an edge of a table would look, be like if it wasn't rounded. But if you are hit with something that's more rounded, that force is going to be dis dissipated and um, you're not going to be injured as, as much. So that is one of the reasons why we want to use equipment that is safe and easily cleaned. We want equipment that is energy efficient. Um, and we want equipment that is safe. 
we could talk a little bit more about that, but we're coming up to the end, and I can't believe it. <laughs> um, I have here a number of principles of motion economy. I think that they are fairly understandable, and so I'm not going to read each one of them to you. But I think that I have some good news for you. At least I hope that is the case anyway. Um, but I want to look at this one slide and then we'll talk about the good news. The bottom line in terms of layout and design is to work, hard, work smarter rather than harder. So think about what is involved in doing the work and plan that work in such a way that you don't have to put out so much physical energy to, to do that work. And my hope is that as you are involved in any layout and design project, that you do it in such a way that it is going to be as productive for your employees as possible. And we'll talk more about that tomorrow.